Um, my name is Ellie Robley. I'm the admissions coordinator at Corpus Christi. And uh, today we have the lovely panelists of Dr. Michael Sutherland, who is our admissions tutor, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm uh, Michael Sutherland. Uh, I am a physicist here at Corpus Christi College, uh, as well as the admissions tutor. Um, I will hang around at the end, just in case there's any um, specific admissions related questions, but the real expert um, is, is our other panelist. Perfect, um, and our other panelist is Dr. Katrina Hutton, who is one of our wonderful students currently um, and has lived through the BMAT experience. So we thought we'd bring in a real expert for you. She's gonna talk you through um, kind of what to prepare for and how to get ready and that sort of thing which you already know because that's why you signed up today um but i will i will pass over to her um quickly before i do i want just to make everyone aware of the q a function um we'll be answering some questions at the end of this if you want to uh ask them that's the place to do it you should have them either at the top of your screen or the bottom of your screen depending on which zoom you have um, on what type of computer, uh, but I will be typing answers to questions throughout and we'll pass them to Katrina at the end of this session. And if we can't answer them, we'll give you an, an email address that you can refer them on to so we can, we can have a bit more time to, to get you a better answer. But I'll pass over to Katrina because she's the reason that you're here. <laughs> Hi, um, so my name is Katerina. I'm a fourth year medical student here at Corpus. So I have been through the BMAT and everything. So I'm just going to give you a bit of a talk about what Cambridge want from the BMAT, what the BMAT is. We're going to go through some past questions and just give you a bit of my like personal experience having gone through it all. So I will share my screen. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, so um, as I said, I'm a fourth year medical student. This is Corpus. This is a view from um, my window um, last year. So got to live right in the center, which is lovely. And then here, just a bit about me. These are some slightly embarrassing photos. Um, on the left is when I first started here. So um, I arrived in 2018. Um, I came from a state school. Um, so I didn't have a lot of help and I think that's why a lot of why you guys are here didn't have a lot of help with the kind of beam out and that sort of missions process that I know other people at like private schools did and this is me last year so I graduated halfway through graduated with a, um, you graduate three years with a degree in medical sciences and I like focused on neuroscience that's me and my graduation um, last year and then this year I finally started in the hospital so that's me very excited about having a stethoscope and um, so that's where I am today. And how did I get here? Well, Cambridge let me in. And um, this is just, so what I've got up here is just a bit of an official look at what Cambridge are looking for. This is what they say um, when they're assessing applicants. So you've got, of course, your academic record. I think you're all here because you've got strong um, grades and stuff like that. And obviously that is important. Your personal statement as well. It's, I think, especially for medicine, it's always an important thing. Medicine is a big lifelong commitment and they want to see that you've thought it through, you've tried it out and you know that this is something you want to do. School or college reference always, your teachers will write you a reference and then any written work that's not so much for medicine other subjects you may have to do to submit some essays and things like that. Performance and early written assessments in this case this is the BMAP and that's what we're going to talk about today. And then just consider contextual data. So this can be things like um, any extenuate, um, any like um, local like social factors so things like your school's GCSE performance and things like that. I don't know if I've, have I frozen. Sorry, I think I just froze. But yeah, I was just saying contextual data is things like your school performance. Um, and then obviously, I don't know if you know this yet, but there's an interview. Most medical schools will have an interview um, and Oxford in particular have quite a lot of focus on the interview. So this is kind of the official look. Um, and like, so the key thing I think with Cambridge opposed to other medical schools is that they, they don't assign certain percentages. There's no like school-based system by which they'll uh, consider a candidate. I know other universities will say, we consider the BMAP for 20% of how we assess you but it's not like that Cambridge they try to look at you as a whole and so I think 
what that meant and how I understood it is all this stuff is great um, for getting your foot in the door, getting to interview and trying to show them you care about medicine, you're passionate about science and you're the right sort of candidate. Um, and someone they feel they'd be able to teach, which is the main point of the interview. But um, obviously that's not the main thing we're talking about today, talk about the BMAP, um, which is the assessment. So, in, so to take the BMAP, um, you will do, probably either do it at school or at a local test centre. Um, so it's something you can probably ask your school about if they're offering it. Um, so you register and you, it's not like online registration, it will generally be via the test centre. I think this is right that the deadline is the 15th of October. The exams will take place in November. So that's a bit later than it was for me. I think it's a COVID thing. Um, I took mine in October. But, um, and, but interviews for Cambridge and also for other medical students tend to start around December and continue into the next year. But I think for Cambridge, it's mainly December. And basically, the main thing about all the information you need on the BMAP is available online on the website for the BMAP. So, um, it's all there. And I think, he, um, yeah, so what the BMAT is, well, normally it's a written multiple choice assessment with a writing task at the end. But this year, I think it's a um, computer based thing. So that wasn't the case for me, but that again is a like, COVID measure that they're doing. So it basically is a two hour paper that's divided into three sections and you'll do each section one after the other. The first section is this kind of thinking skills. They're quite general problem solving skills, reading a bit. Um, then section two is where you use your scientific knowledge. So it won't be anything above GCSE content level, but we'll talk a bit more about what that means. And then the third section is writing. This is a really quite a strange, very short essay that you have to write. And it's kind of a classic bit of persuasive writing that you'll have to do. And so just through this presentation, I'm going to go through each of the sections in a bit more detail. And I've put a couple of practice questions that hopefully you can have a go at while we're on here. Um, yeah, so next. So the BMAT, it's got a bit of a funny marking. It's not like your GCSEs, A-levels. So it's scored between one and nine. And it's scored to one decimal place. And you can kind of see it's this normal distribution of marking. So very few people will get marks at either end of the spectrum. So again, it's, don't think of it like your A-levels and your GCSEs where you want to get the A-star and lots of people who are applying will get the A-star. That's not the case. And the marking is quite different. You're much more likely to get a middle score um, than get the top grade. Um, and section three, the writing task is scored between zero and five. Um, and then you also have this score, A, B, C, D, E, for quality of English. So it's your classic spelling, punctuation and grammar, which I'm sure you have at GCSE as well. Um, yeah, but I just wanted to start with basically the main thing you need to know about the BMAP and also the UCAT as well, if you're doing that. And is the key difference between it and your GCSEs and A-levels is the time pressure. GCSEs, A-levels, you expect to be able to complete all the questions in the time, you know, especially if you're bright and you're aiming for good grades and you're hardworking, you would expect that you can finish all the questions in the time. That's not the case with these exams. It's really, really much more time pressured. So for the general um, sort of reasoning one, you have two minutes per question, which sounds like quite a lot, but it's quite a lot to get through. And for the scientific one, you have about... Um, I think one minute per question, and then literally half an hour in total for your essay, which is very, very time pressured. And so, um, and so the key thing here is like, like, one thing they say is the average candidate will only get 50% of the questions correct. So it's, you're not expected to be able to answer all the questions correctly. Um, and I say the main thing that can make you do badly in your BMAP is getting in there, panicking and running out of time. So your absolute number one thing is don't get in there and panic because you feel like the time's slipping away and you're spending loads of time on questions. But that's easier said than done. So how do you stop yourself panicking in the exam? Um, and it is simply number three, practice. 
um, just by going over past papers and stuff. Yeah, so just by going over the past papers, you will get a feel for the questions, get a feel for how long they take, know how many you can do in the time. Um, and then once you have that idea, you can then strategize. You can say, what, how am I going to approach these questions? You know, am I going to try and skip ones that seem to be taking me a long time? Is there a certain type of question that I feel I can do quickly? And the questions I know will take me longer, maybe I want to leave those to the end. Come up with a strategy, try and think about that sort of thing, what sort of thing. If you're prepared to skip questions that you think are taking you too long, you won't feel panicked in the exam when a question is taking you too long because you planned for that. And then once you've got your strategy, once you understand, you know, what sort of questions you want to skip, practice again, see if it works. Can you do it all in the time? Do you feel OK doing that? And that is the main thing, because the time pressure is the questions are not super tricky. They're probably stuff you could do quite easily if you have the time for it. The key thing that makes it difficult is you have to do them quickly. Um, and so to find your practice material, the best place is the BMAT website. You can get past papers going back all the way to um, 2003, I think. Um, and so there's plenty of questions for you to practice with. Um, and they also have a computer based, they've never, I don't think they've done computer based before. So they've also got a computer based one for you to try that system and get used to that system. And um, so there'll be, there's one thing I found, you probably find this as well. There's lots and lots of companies that will try to sell you BMAP practice stuff, books and all sorts of things. You don't need them. They're not very helpful. Um, tutoring, things like that, it's not, as good as just sitting and practicing and spending that time practicing. And I know because I made quite myself a bit of money over the summer doing a bit of tutoring and I don't think I helped at all. The main thing you have to do is sit and spend the time practicing and getting familiar with the questions and you'll find your brain just absorbs it. Um, okay, so I think um, next we're just gonna drill down into each of the sections. Um, so this is the first section um, is these general thinking skills and they say it consists of two types of questions, um, problem solving ones. This is a bit more like if you've ever done sort of quantitative reasoning, but I, I don't know if, if maybe you're doing the UCAP, you can kind of imagine um, the sort of quantitative mathematical reasoning. So it's a bit more maths, but not just, you know, straightforward um, GCSE maths, it's a bit more thinking and reading. And then critical thinking is much more about you having to read a certain passage and try and get the meaning out of it, the key points out of it. Um, and so you should, you'll have both of these questions. And do note, this has changed. This is new for 2020. Before that, there were additional two types of questions, data analysis, which is more graphs and inference, where you'd have a really long passage of text, a bit more like your verbal reasoning. Um, and so they've removed both of those. So that's something to just bear in mind when you're doing, if you want to do any past papers. Um, but I think probably it's still worth just answering them because a lot of the skills will be the same and it'll give you a good idea of the time and get you practiced with the time pressure anyway. And so um, next there's just, so this is an example question. Um, I don't know if um, you want to have a little go at doing it or, um, in the chat, but I think it might take a bit long. Um, so I'll just go through. Um, yeah, so you can see lent cars, hire out cars at cost of £50 per day if the number of miles travelled is less than 80. So next charge of £1 for every mile travelled over 80 miles. Down for hire charge £60 per day for taking the car out and then 50 people every mile travelled. For how many miles travelled would the cost of hiring a car be the same for both hire companies? Um, and so this question you would have about two minutes to do, which is okay. It's not, you can do it. There'll be other questions that maybe aren't as tricky, but basically each question has like, as well as your kind of basic maths, which you don't get calculated for by the way. So get good with your like mental maths and your kind of column multiplication and all that. Um, but 
in addition to that, there'll be something you've got to kind of notice, something you've got to figure out to make it a bit more straightforward. So this is how I would have done this question. And I don't think it's the only way to do this question. Um, but I, but I would always start with this kind of thing, setting up your algebra equation. It's exactly what you know. So you call the miles traveled X. And then this is the little trick that I think you have to spot because um, so we, all the options are above 80 miles. So you know that it has to be, um, the distance travel has to be greater than 80 miles. And this is important because in the question, um, you've got a cost for Lenten cars if it's less than 80, there's an extra charge of one pound for every mile traveled over 80 miles. So we can set that up because we know that it's going to be over 80. So therefore we can say that the cost for Lenten cars is 50, the kind of base charge, plus um, X minus 80, which is the number of miles minus 80. So then we know the number of miles over 80 and it should really be times by one because it's one pound. Um, and then we can do the same thing and figure out the cost for Dunford Hire, which will be, I don't know why it's going that way, um, 60 plus, 0 0.5 because 0 0.5 was because it was 50p for every mile travelled so 0 0.5 times x um, and then it's 60 pounds was the base charge and then it's just a matter of okay we're looking for the point that they cost the same so we set them equal to each other start rearranging and you'll get your answer that x is 180 and we can go back and see that that is option e so you can see it's not very high level maths. It's just, you have to kind of notice how you decide how you're going to set it up. Some of the questions might be more difficult. I think the key thing is if you don't notice immediately, how are you going to do this? How are you going to set it up? It's probably going to take you too long. So you should skip it and come back to it. Um, okay. And then this is the next type of question. You can see that it's really different. So what you've got here is you've got quite a large paragraph to read. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll, I'll read it out quickly. So it says, in this senior management post, we need someone who can keep a cool head in the press and react quickly to events. The applicant says he suffers from a phobia about flying and panics, especially when an aircraft is landing, and that therefore he'll prefer not to travel abroad on business if it could be avoided. He's obviously a very nervous type of person who will clearly go to pieces and panic in an emergency and fail to provide the leadership qualities necessary for the job. Therefore, this person is not a suitable candidate for the post. Which of the following is the best statement of the flaw in the argument above? So that's a really common question to ask you is they'll say, what's the flaw in the argument? Or what's the key point of the argument? Something like that. And that's tricky because there can be statements there that are true or that feel true, but it's not what the flaw in the argument is. It's not what the key flaw is. And so this one, let me talk you through um, the answer here. So looking at A first, it assumes phobias are not treatable or capable of being eliminated. So I mean, that is, it's a flaw in the argument, potentially, you know, it doesn't discuss whether they could help him with his phobia, but that's not the main flaw in this argument because, um, the kind of the key point of this argument is that he panics and therefore is not a suitable candidate. So considering him as he is now, so it's not really the right answer. B, so it assumes that the person appointed to the job will need to travel abroad. Um, this is maybe true, but it's not really. So he's saying that the, their argument is not that because he can't travel abroad, he's not suitable for the job. Their argument is instead that he has a phobia, panics, and is therefore not suitable for the job. So we can see that that's not really what they're arguing. And so um, C is our correct answer. It assumes that a specific phobia and the fact that they can be to panic. This is the key flaw in their argument. He's got a phobia of getting on planes. They're, there, they're saying that ev in every function, there's, you know, he's obviously a very nervous person person who clearly goes to pieces of an emergency. So their assumption there is that because he has one specific phobia about flying, he would panic too much and therefore is not suitable for the job. 
So that's not true. That is technically correct, but you can see. Um, so DNA, I think, is slightly trickier to rule out, but we can still see why they're not correct. So D, it assumes that people say polynephritis would be with lasers. Um, me reading that option, I would just say that's not really the main point. It's all about his phobia. That's what they're talking about. But from the kind of official mark scheme, I think what they say here is that um, this post, it says, we need someone who can keep a cool, cool head in a crisis and they're actually keeping events. They're not assuming that everyone who can stay cool in a crisis will be a good leader, which is what D is saying. It doesn't say if there's any other qualities. And, it, and I think that's quite a lot of thinking, but I think maybe intuitively you can see that that's not the main point. Their argument is whether people are cool in a crisis are good leaders. That's not the main discussion that we can have. And then E, um, it fails to take into account other qualities the person might have to the post. Yeah, that might be true, but it's not really what the whole paragraph's about. You know, the paragraph is about his phobia and him being a leader. The person, it's not about his other qualities being a leader. So that's not the main flaw in this argument. I think you can see they're quite, quite tricky. They're just, you know, quite semantic. It's quite specific. It's not easy to just be like, yeah, this is obviously the correct answer. Um, but I think the best way to think about it is, oh, I've got a little thing here. So, Ka think Katarina, Ka sorry, yeah. can I just interject? I think um, your the volume went down. Something happened to your okay. microphone. Okay. For how how long? Uh, just for the the last slide, we could hear you, but it was a little bit quiet. I don't know if there's a connection that needs to be wiggled. Can you hear me now? Is it okay, or is it still quiet? It sounds. Oh, I can hear you, but it's it's very dim. any better yeah i think that sounds a lot better okay great we'll try it with this okay um yeah so i'll just yeah i'll just talk about this last bit i think this is the best way to try and think about these questions um because they can be a bit tricky so basically i've put a little flow chart which is kind of summarizing the main steps of their argument they're thinking number one that he has a phobia this therefore means that he panics when the plane lands. This panic means that he won't be cool in any crisis and is therefore not a suitable candidate. And I think highlighted in red, you can see the main leap that seems wrong. Just because someone panics when a plane lands doesn't mean in every crisis um, they won't be cool in it and will panic. And I think the best way to think about it is like this. You've just got to try and see the steps in their argument and say, what is the weak link in this argument? Where exactly is it? And then you choose the option that matches best up with that weak link. Um, OK. And then, so OK, I'll move on to the science section. So this is section two. Um, it consists of questions related to like GCSE level content on biology, chemistry, physics and math. Um, so chances are you're probably all taking biology and most likely chemistry A levels. So this shouldn't be, that sort of content shouldn't be too much for you. However, even for those, it's important to check the specification. And I've just shown a tiny bit of the specification here. You can find it online at the BMAT website because different exam boards for GCSE have slightly different content on their exams and it changes quite often. And so there may be content in the BMAT specification you didn't cover in your GCSE, maybe you haven't got to it yet at A-level and other exam boards would have covered it and therefore it's considered GCSE level content. So just have a look, go through the specification, see if there's anything you think, I don't remember learning that, and then just try and find some GCSE level resources just to bring you up to speed on that. Like I think I remember for me, I hadn't covered much about the eye in my GCSE, but other exam boards had done quite a lot about the eye. So I had to read up a little bit on that. Um, I think physics is probably a key area where you could become quite unstuck. Um, I took physics at A level, but I know lots of people don't when applying for medicine. And even then I found it quite tricky. There's things, it's, you know, it, 
they don't choose medically related aspects of physics it is just physics it is just you will do like there'll be questions in circuits that sort of stuff so that might be a case of something you have to go over your GCSE textbooks and spend a bit of time on refreshing your memory. Um, but it's probably not worth spending, once you've got an idea of what's in the specification, you're happy with what you've learned, what you don't remember, and like try to revise the bits you don't remember, you don't need to spend ages reading through your GCSE stuff over and over again. I think it'd be much better, it's the time pressure again that will kill you. It's one minute per question that's the tricky part in this so again it's just about getting used to that time pressure getting used to the format of the questions they won't be straight gcse questions and i think we'll look at one in a minute um yeah but it's not the science just because it's the scientific section doesn't mean it's got anything to do with medicine most of them don't you will be asked chemistry physics and maths questions that don't seem to have anything to do um, with medicine. Okay, and so I'm just going to go over a biology question because I've forgotten all my chemistry and physics, so I think it's the only one that I can really talk about. But um, so this is an example of the question. You've got a table here showing you concentrations in cell one and cell two, and of different substances P, Q, R, and S. And it asks you which overall movement of a substance between the two cells requires oxygen. And so you can see here, the key thing to notice here is what does requires oxygen mean? Requires oxygen must mean that it is active transport that is required rather than passive diffusion. And so you can see that this, this is where the questions slightly differ from like a GCSE style question, because GCSE style question will probably just say, which of these is active transport. It won't try and make you think an extra level into the question and into the process itself. A lot of these questions will try and get, they're trying to get your understanding rather than just your memorization. So they'll try and go a little extra level um, to help you do it. So in this case, um, option C is correct, where you move from cell two, which has a concentration of four, um, to cell one, which has a concentration of seven, and so obviously that's against the concentration gradient. You're moving from a low concentration to a high concentration, and that's going to require active transport, and that requires oxygen. So C is the correct answer. And then also there's a maths question. This is quite simple. It is a right angle triangle, tells you the sides, and it just wants the area. So I'm sure you remember how to do this from your GCSE. Area of a triangle is a half base times the height. The tricky thing here is getting comfortable with using roots, root two. Just think of it like X or any other algebra thing. You just kind of ignore it, deal with it as it is until you get to. Um, so here you would multiply out the brackets, but obviously root two times root two is two. Um, and then because you can leave the answer in root two, it's just a case of working through um, to get to your answer, which is three minus root two centimeters squared. So it's not massively high level, it's your GCSE content, but it's time pressured and you don't have a calculator and there might be some extra level just to test your understanding rather than making it super straightforward for you. Um, okay, and then finally, um, section three. This is quite weird and quite tricky to get your head around. It is the last half hour of your paper will be a writing task. Um, and so you'll get given three essay questions, like the ones you see on the side. This is from the year I did it. And they'll tend to be, not always true, but they'll tend to be one question where it's a quote, a very general philosophical quote. A second question where it's a quote related to science. And the third question where it's a quote related more specifically to medicine. And so it tends to be these sort of quotes. They ask you to explain what the statement is trying to say. So you're essentially giving the argument for the statement. They ask you to argue that it is the opposite of what the statement is saying. And then they ask you to give your personal opinion. And you have to do all of that in half an hour on this tiny sheet of paper on the right. So I think for you guys, you'll be on the computer. So you will have um, a 
550 word word limit to do it in instead um so for me all i got was this one sheet of paper you weren't allowed to ask for any more paper that was tricky because it meant you couldn't really cross things out you couldn't write a paragraph and start again you know you just had to do it and you only had half an hour which is really not long so you it was all about taking the time to plan it's you probably had loads of that from GCSE English I always hated planning but it's really important you do it for this because you don't have time to rewrite sections you've only got 550 words so you want to get key points across um, and so in terms of structuring the writing task it's quite weird this is how I would do it and this is how I did it in my exam um, is put it into four paragraphs your first paragraph is where you say what is this statement actually saying you know what are they trying to get you to argue that sort of thing and then i would put a little thing at the end saying however you know obviously however this may not be true and i will this is what will be discussed that sort of thing at the end to introduce you to your next two paragraphs which will be two points of arguing the opposite and this is where you're using your standard persuasive writing techniques. You're using your point evidence explanation, exactly what they've taught you at GCSE. Um, and you're just giving, try and find two, they don't have to be super inventive arguments, um, but two things that argue against the statement you've been given. And then in paragraph four is you kind of sum up and you have to give your own view, in which case it's a good idea to try and explain both sides of the argument and then but you have to be quite persuasive so you could give the other side to what you're trying to argue and then counter it that's always a good thing to do in persuasive writing is give the other side of the argument but and say however this is the problem with it and therefore i think this um and so it's not long it's not very complicated um but it's tricky getting all of that in in a very short amount of words and trying to make it um good so i was just going to talk a bit about this question this is the one i answered in the exam and just the sort of things that i said um, to get a good mark on this question so for the first bit you've got what is the reasoning behind this statement this makes up your first paragraph explain what the statement is saying so this is just a case i mean it was quite simple what i wrote is saying in terms of the only moral obligation science test is to reveal the truth. What does that mean? This statement is arguing that um, scientists must be truthful all the time. This is in cases of always publishing their results, you know, upholding um, good standards of practice to ensure their results are accurate and truthful. Um, and always endeavouring to like push towards the truth even if it's difficult even if other people um don't agree with it and don't like it so it's quite it's not high level you know deeply read argue arguing that you're doing it's just giving some simple points to show that you understand what they're trying to get what this quote is trying to say and then you kind of finish off that paragraph with saying however you know the fact so i chose to pick the kind of key problem i had with the quote was that the fact that it's the only moral obligation um you know this may not be the there are other important obligations okay and then so your next two paragraphs are you give what your problems are so my first paragraph i said scientists have to have other mo or mo other moral obligations and i gave and in this case you want to make your point and then give it an example give some evidence and explain it um, so what I did then was I gave the example of um, the treatment um, of prisoners in concentration camps and experiments that were performed on them, how this, you know, it's thoroughly reprehensible and this kind of thing. And it's, you know, I think that's something, it's not something super niche, it's something lots of people know about, but it's just, it's giving the right sort of information, picking an example of something you've read, something you've heard. You don't have to give a lot of detail. I didn't know much about it, but it's about being persuasive rather than giving lots of information. And then I did another paragraph where I wrote about um, cases where scientists may be morally obligated not to reveal the truth. And again, I just gave the example of 
in cases of nuclear weapons. You know, we shouldn't just make the blueprints for nuclear weapons available to everyone for free access. And again, that's not a particularly high level or clever point. It's just about arguing it persuasively and explain, giving a good example of something you know that proves your point. And then finally, in the paragraph, you just give your own opinion. You weigh up both sides and give your own opinion. And um, I think it's probably easier, no matter what your opinion is, it's probably easier to go with the things you've argued in the previous paragraphs because you don't have to re-persuade them of the opposite view when you don't have much space. So it's probably a good idea to, whatever you think your opinion is, try and keep in line with the argument. Um, but yeah, but I think that brings me to the end of everything I wanted to say and I'm super super happy to answer any questions you've got. That's all right. That's great, thank you so much. Um, we didn't actually have very many questions come in. There was a bit of confusion around the biology question, if you wouldn't mind circling yeah. back. Um, Sorry, I didn't see, I've just seen the chat now. No, that's okay. I didn't want to interrupt, you were on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the question was, yes, why so is B not also possible? So B, um, cell one to cell two. No, that's true. But that may be a case of how I've copied over the question. Um, things may have got a bit mixed up. Let me double check. So two. Yeah, I think that's a case where I've copied over the question a little bit wrong and it's got a bit mixed up. Um, so sorry about that. That's okay. That was there on purpose to see how many how many people <laughs> noticed. Um, so we have another question for you. How, how long did you prepare for the BMAT and how long did you do you recommend to revise for? Um, that's tricky. I, I think I was quite nervous about it. Um, so I had a look at it over the summer, um, not in depth, not very much. I think my main focus, I had the UCAT in September. So, and then I had the BMAT in October. I don't think I did a lot of BMAT preparation before the UCAT. So at most I've done a month. I think maybe it's a good idea to have a look over it now, have a look at a couple of questions. I don't know, you guys probably take it in November. If I go back. Um, you guys probably take it in November. So you've got time, you've got plenty of time. Um, but maybe, particularly if it's something that maybe is worrying you a bit, have a look over it, try a couple of questions, see how comfortable you feel with it. And then maybe once it's coming up, just take some time to focus on it. Um, hopefully, Obviously, you guys are still doing your A-levels, and that is super important. Um, so you do need to focus on that. It's not about sacrificing all of that to do your BMAT. Um, but yeah, I'd say in the kind of, particularly the couple of weeks, potentially the month before, just doing a bit of practice, and then maybe the couple of weeks before, take it a bit more seriously and doing it quite um, a lot. But I think it's it's just a case of how much you feel you can fit alongside your studies and also having a life as well. Obviously, the more practice is always going to help, but it's a balance between that and your A levels and everything else you've got going on. So, and just to confirm, the BMAT this year is November third, so it is a little bit later than it has been in previous years. Great, thank you. Um, another question. What are your best tips to brainstorm ideas for and against the statement in section three when you are struggling to do so? Um, yeah, it's tricky because you don't have a lot of time, but usually the questions, they won't be too hard. Um, they won't be too out there. I think if you're trying, if you find yourself trying too hard to think of something, maybe that's not the right question for you. Try and pick one, you'll have three options. I chose the science one because I'm much more comfortable talking about scientific debates and scientific process and research and something I found myself more comfortable with. 
there'll be a medicine once. So I think the same things they're telling you now of keep reading the news, keep reading interesting scientific and medical things that come up because it does come in handy if you've read a case recently you can probably fit it into your questions fit into arguing if you're engaged and involved you should be able to think of something it shouldn't you really don't have to think of anything too niche and you know if you can't think of a great relevant story or point you just write persuasively you just show off your writing skills instead um and you don't have a lot of time to brainstorm so it won't really be a case of trying to make yourself think you just have to trust that something's going to pop up in your head thank you um i have a question that might actually be better suited to pass to michael um does cambridge have a bmat cut off score or an average score no, we, we don't have a, a cutoff score. I mean, we, we use BMAT in the first instance um, in our decisions uh, who to call to interview. Um, and it is, you know, possible to, you know, not have a particularly great BMAT score if other elements of your application are strong, but certainly having a very strong BMAT score um, very much increases your likelihood of being called to, to interview. Um, and then the second way that we use the BMAT um, is in the final decision making process. So after we have, you know, the results of, of the interviews and, and all the other information, um, sometimes we can use the BMAT as, as a tiebreaker, for instance. So certainly um, scoring the best that you can um, improve your chances of receiving an offer. Um, but if, you know, one section of the BMAT doesn't go particularly well or two sections, um, there are other opportunities for you. To, to demonstrate your academic potential. So it's not the end all and, and be all, but of course, if your score is very, very low, um, so maybe in the bottom, say, you know, 10 or 20% of applicants, um, the likelihood of being called through to interview um, decreases quite a bit. Great, thank you. Um, and then I think one that, one that follows on from that really nicely is, do you think the BMAT will hold more weight this year as most of us haven't done GCSEs? Ha, huh, uh, interesting question. Um, well, I mean, we will receive um, teacher assess grades, um, and those will count as your as your GCSEs. Um, we do trust teachers. Um, you know, we think teachers uh, can give us a, a fair indication of of your academic abilities. So we'll be looking at those GCSE grades. But 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 you're right. I mean, they're not exams sat in the same way that um, uh, say Katarina would would have sat um, several years ago. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, one thing that we mentioned previously, and I would emphasize this again, is that when we make all these decisions, um, unlike other universities that maybe have a formula, you know, 20% BMAT, 10% this, um, we do really try to, to build up a picture of you as an individual. So, um, you know, we look at all the elements together. So the question about the GCSEs, I mean, you know, we hope that your teachers are um, predicting good things um, or, or have, have awarded you good, uh, good grades. Um, but, you know, they, we will be looking at, at the BMAT and all the other elements of the application together um, when we make our, our, our decisions. I know that's not a sort of a concrete answer, but, um, you know, I think that's about as specific as we can be at, at this point. Great, thank you. Um, and then there's some questions just about improving different aspects. So if someone uh, keeps getting the same score and they just don't feel like they're improving and improving on spatial reasoning questions, do you have any particular advice, um, Katerina? Yeah, I mean, I think um, if you're struggling to keep getting the same score, I think it will probably take a little while to build up that familiarity with the questions. So it is just a case, you know, you are going to sit the exam, just keep going with the practice, keep seeing the questions, and it will gradually work its way into your brain. Especially a lot of the general questions are quite, they're tricky, there's no method, there's no notes you can read that are going to help you out. It's just getting a feel for what they are asking you with the questions, what sort of questions, what methods they're going to make you use. Um, and that is really the only way. For the science, potentially, if you still find you keep getting the same score, maybe you need to go back and do some more of the GCSE revision. Um, but I think it will really trust the practice that it will help you in the end. So long as you're like thinking about it, try and you know, read the marks. If you make mistakes, if you're getting questions wrong, go back 
and think about why it was wrong. Don't just say, oh, I got that wrong. That's my score. I'll do another paper. Go and think about why it was wrong. Um, I think for spatial reasoning, I think that's potentially on the UK CAT or the UCAT as they call it now, rather than the BMAT. Um, so I think the BMAT shouldn't really have shapes, that sort of non-verbal stuff. It will be math stuff or um, this kind of arguments thing. But yeah, I mean, UK CAT is even more of the same. It's even less kind of um, related to your knowledge and your scientific knowledge. That one is sheer doing the questions over and over and over and over again to the point that like you don't even know why you think that's the right answer. You've just got used to it now. Um, yeah, that answers the question. Great, thank you. Um, and then there's a question about uh, kind of how the BMAT works with the interview and that is do you refer to the BMAT writing task in the interview that's more for Michael sorry I should have, I should have started yeah um I mean it may be that some colleges would look at the at the at the essay but um at Corpus I, I don't think we do um generally the, the interviews themselves um tend to be a, um, a mixture of sort of quite specific science questions and, and often drawing on um, A-level knowledge, um, as well as um, uh, clinical type questions. So um, ethical questions, things to assess your suitability um, as, a, as a potential doctor. Uh, and it's pretty rare, I, I would say, that we would go back and look at a BMAT essay. I don't wanna say it's never done because I'm sure there's one college maybe that has done it in the past, but at Corpus, um, we, we don't. Actually, I wonder, um, Katarina, if, if you might reflect on your interviews while, while we're here, um, without giving away any of the specific questions, um, what were the sorts of things that, that came up? Yeah, yeah, so just going through the BMAT, uh, yeah, there was nothing in my interview. The one thing I would say, UCL, I also applied to, they give you back your essay at the beginning of your interview and get you to read it over and then they'll just discuss it with you a bit in the interview. So that's the only one that I know might consider. Um, but I think most of the other universities doesn't seem to come up. Um, but yeah, so my interview, I, you'll hear this probably quite a lot if you speak to Cambridge students. I kind of surprisingly enjoyed my interview. Um, I love talking, so it's just a great chance to <laughs> get to talk for half an hour or so um but it's they'll be kind of their questions um they're quite like intellectually stimulating questions so there'll be question the key thing about them i think is they're going to ask you a question you won't just be able to immediately answer um they'll ask you a question and you'll think god like i don't know i'm not a clue i don't know what that is at all i've got no idea what you have to do then is you just have to start somewhere and explain where your head is at the second they ask you the question and then you gotta um just ask questions back just say well i'm not sure is this like what about this what about that and it will be based on your like gcse a level knowledge of biology and chemistry and things like that um and they'll know what gcse's you've done so if you haven't done uh biology because i think you can just apply with chemistry then it won't be so focused on that or if you've done physics or haven't done physics that will come into it i think and um yeah. i'd say they're really there is a bit i was told before i came by someone i knew they won't ask you anything, about anything you've said in your personal statement i didn't find that i did get the kind of classic question of like do you want to be a doctor but that like why do you want to be a doctor you'll probably get that at every medical school it's an important question to ask um but so you will get a bit of kind of medicine focused, personal focused stuff and you'll get the science questions, which is just about working through a kind of interesting scientific problem with them rather than you sitting there and perfectly answering it. But yeah, I, I really enjoyed mine and they're kind of they're based on what supervisions will be like when you get here, which is where you have teaching you and a couple of other people with a supervisor and it is that sort of format of asking you questions, trying to improve your understanding of something. So yeah, don't be scared of them. They're quite fun. That's, that's great, thank you. Um, and just so that everyone's aware as well, we did uh, recently host kind of a similar presentation Q&A about preparing for interview. Those will be available, the recordings will be available next week on our website. So um, you can check back for those on the Corpus website if you have more interview questions. 
Um, we are coming to the end now. I just want to give everyone a reminder of kind of important deadlines that you might want to be aware of. Um, so our application deadline is going to be October 15th this year, but the BMAT registration, uh, which you will probably want to know, is October 1st. So make sure those are in your diary. If you have any questions or concerns, please be in touch with our admissions office. I will put our email address in the chat now. Um, but thank you so much for coming today. Special thanks to Katerina for, for hosting and for presenting. Um, yeah, thank you all very much. Um, as I said, I'll put the contact details in the chat. So if you need anything at all, please ping us an email. Great, thank you.